Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to our March meeting of the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. My name is Stephen Buckland. I'm the current president. And I'm really excited to share some updates on the club with everyone. So just another reminder, a new thing we're trying out this year for our Zoom meetings is a mushroom ID session following the speaker. Um, Last month we tried doing it in Did a breakout room. Did you tap on that? This little microphone. Sorry about that. I just muted everyone and you will not be able to unmute yourself. Um, so put it in the chat if you would like to be unmuted and speak. Um, but yeah, Mushroom ID session. Uh, we're just going to do it in the main room this time instead of in a breakout room because pretty much everyone was here for the ID session by the end of the meeting. Um, but other questions or discussion topics are always welcome at that end portion of the meeting. So yeah, bring your photos. I think tonight, uh, Kara and Garrett are gonna be focusing on morels and false morels since that's the season we're heading into. They're gonna be sharing some of their cool finds in the, in the gyromitra and verpa and morcella genera. I also wanted to announce our new photography chair, Sarah Klingensmith. Um, thank you much, so much, Sarah, for volunteering to take on this position. Um, and thank you to Josh Doty for serving for two years in this position as well. Um, really awesome to see folks volunteering for the club to, to keep making fun stuff happen. So remember to submit your pictures for the photo contest, I think by sometime in September. So we're just at the beginning of mushroom season this year, plenty of time to get out and get some good photos. Everyone should have received their March and April newsletter. Um, there's some articles in there on our 2021 meetings, the City Nature Challenge, some stuff on Daniel Gillies, Tremides, Versicolor Research, um, and lots of other goodies. And submissions are always welcome for the newsletter. So if there's anything you'd like to contribute, um, reach out to Cecily Franklin, the newsletter editor. All right, so now we've got some upcoming walks. Um, these are events that Allegheny Land Trust is hosting with um, Julie Travellini, our current secretary and a club identifier. The April 30th and May 23rd walks are already sold out. Wow, that, that happened fast. Um, but there will be plenty of other walks throughout the year. Um, some really special walks coming up June 9th and July 17th. Uh, locations to be announced should be a fun surprise for folks who've been keeping an eye on Allegheny Land Trust's activities in the region. Um, there will also be a walk at uh, Sycamore Island on July 31st. And that one is going to be $25, but that includes a boat ticket, a ticket on the boat to the island um, for a fun walk out in the middle of the Allegheny River. <laughs> I really hope I can make it to that one this year. Here are some events that I'll be doing coming up um, for the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. I added a walk April 16th in Highland Park. This is my first in-person hike um, since COVID started. And that's gonna be limited to 10 people and free. You can register online at pittsburghparks.org slash events. Um, that'll probably be up here in a couple weeks, the registration for that, it's not up yet. Other things, I'm doing a spring mushroom webinar on April 28th and I'll be doing a virtual hike around Highland Park on April 30th, um, kicking off the City Nature Challenge. And, you know, I'll probably be biased and focusing mostly on the fungi and lichens that I'm finding while I'm out showing folks how to use iNaturalist. And that'll be a Facebook Live hike 
on the Parks Conservancy's Facebook. Speaking of the City Nature Challenge, it's coming up here pretty soon. Um, and it expands way beyond just Pittsburgh. Any of the surrounding counties, um, if you're out on this weekend, April 30th through May 3rd, and you take photos of any cool stuff, not just mushrooms, and you post it to iNaturalist, it'll be counted towards Pittsburgh's totals in the City Nature Challenge this year. So plan on getting out sometime that weekend. It runs Friday through Monday, so four day weekend. Um, of this global digital bio blitz. And you can read more about that in our latest newsletter. Here's a rundown of our monthly meetings for the year. We're hoping that we can resume in-person meetings in August. That's our tentative plan. So we moved our annual cultivation meeting to August instead of May so that we could still get folks their mushroom growing kits. Um, but yeah, you can take a look through the titles here. All of the details on these meetings are also posted to our website. So if you visit our website and go to the events page, you can find more details and some photos from each month's speaker. Really excited for all the folks that we have coming to speak for the club this year. Ah, and real quick, there was a question about the City Nature Challenge. Um, any observations that you post to iNaturalist on those dates will automatically be a part of the Pittsburgh count, um, as long as you have it geolocated to somewhere within the surrounding counties. So yeah, you don't have to join the project, but there is a project on there if you want to, to join it um, and be able to keep track of like the leaderboards and what other folks have been posting. Great question. All right, in terms of other events, other club events this year, um, we've got Ooh, next slide. Die Day with Judy McEnroth. So Judy is a, a member of our club and an expert when it comes to dying, and she's going to show us how it's done. No experience is necessary, but space is limited and registration is required. The morning uh, is going to include some mushroom walks, which are free, but the afternoon session is $10. And if you're coming for both, you might want to pack a lunch. There won't be any food provided. Um, to register for Die Day, you can visit our website and go to the events page and scroll to the second page of events and then click the listing for Die Day. Once you're there, you'll find a form to input your name and pay the $10 registration fee. All right, and here's some info on our annual uh, Gary Linkoff Memorial Foray. This year, it's gonna be the weekend of September 18th and 19th with a pre-foray walk in Cook Forest on September 17th. The main events will be at the Rose Barn and we're also planning on having Science Sunday, um, the, the Sunday following the event also at the Rose Barn in North Park. So again, this is tentative. We'll see how things go with COVID, but we're planning on hosting this event. Registration for the main event is $55 for non-members, $35 for members, and there will be a registration and a fee for Science Sunday as well. And a list of workshops will be forthcoming. Our speakers for the Link Off Foray this year will be Leon Chernoff, the editor of Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushrooming, and we'll also have Michael Kuo, the, the developer of MushroomExpert.com. So really awesome speakers. I think it's going to be a really great 
event if you can make it out. Here's our membership report. And these are, numbers are hot off the press. So we're up to 990 members as of today from 554 households. So this is up 86 members and 52 households from the start of the year. And I just wanna say thank you so much to all of our members, new and old for supporting the club. Um, it's really awesome to be a part of such a huge club of dedicated mushroom enthusiasts. So thank you for continuing to support the work that we're doing. And for the folks who are watching the recording of this, who maybe aren't members yet, there's a little bit of information on what our fees are and what some of the benefits are to becoming a member. Some other benefits aside from the ones listed here include that you'll receive our bi-monthly newsletter, you'll get updates on our walks and events, you'll get a discount at um, on the registration for the annual foray, and you'll receive a mushroom grow kit if we host an in-person meeting in August and um, you're able to make it. All right, up next are our Mushroom ID Awards. Our Button ID program recognizes club members who can identify different species of fungi and buttons are awarded at the 10, 25, 50, 75, 100, 150, and 300 level. Members can submit their list for verification to the email above. And we have two buttons to announce tonight. If I can get it to the next slide. So congratulations to Victoria and Jonathan. Victoria submitted a list of 50 different species and Jonathan submitted a list of 25. So we're really happy to award you both with your buttons. Congratulations. Looking forward to your next species list. Oh, I also just remembered, I forgot to announce um, Kara's pop-up walk. So Kara just posted a walk um, at Hillman State Park this weekend. I'm forgetting the exact details. I think it's 10 a.m. on Saturday. I'm sure Kara can post it in the chat if, I'm, if I messed that up. <laughs> All right, next month's meeting, we'll have Daniel Gillies presenting his Trimides Versicolor research. Daniel was a recipient of a scholarship last year from the club, and he'll be presenting on his investigation of color band zonations in turkey tail mushrooms in response to environmental conditions. So that'll be next month's speaker. And before we begin tonight's presentation before I introduce tonight's speaker. Are there any other announcements folks would like to share? Feel free to um, put things in the chat and I can unmute folks as well, if anyone would like to speak. And, ah, so Kara put in the chat, 10 a.m. at Knowlton Road at Hillman State Park, the figure eight trailhead. So bring your mask and your mushroom basket and meet Kara at Hillman State Park. <laughs> cool, well, Oh, the club Facebook page is WPA Mushroom Club. I think it's 
it might be all one word. Maybe someone can post a link to it in the chat. Thanks, Julie. All righty. Well, without further ado, I'll introduce our speakers for tonight. So I want to welcome Trent and Kristen Blizzard, self-proclaimed modern foragers, joining us tonight from their home in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, I believe. And they've been trekking the forest of Colorado, the Midwest, and the Pacific Northwest for years, mostly with wild edible mushrooms in mind. At first a hobby, the hunt for mushrooms quickly became nothing short of an obsession for these two mycophiles, both of whom are certified wild mushroom identification experts in their home state of Colorado. They're the authors of Wild Mushrooms, a cookbook and foraging guide, and they're here tonight to provide us with some tips and techniques to preserve and store mushrooms for year-round enjoyment. So thanks so much, Trent and Kristen, for being here tonight. I'll let you take things away. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Stephen. Hi. Hopefully you guys can hear us OK. Uh, I'm Trent Blizzard, and this is Kristen. Hello. And uh, well, we're psyched to be here today with you guys for the next 45 minutes or so, um, talking about our favorite topic, mushrooms. Um, we have uh, our cookbook here, uh, brand new this fall. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about that, maybe first a little about us um, before we launch into mushroom talk. Um, uh, where should we start? I guess the, the cookbook really came out of a, a, a problem that we had experienced and you guys can probably appreciate this. You do a lot of foraging and, and sometimes it's kind of an embarrassment of riches and you have baskets of edible mushrooms and you really have to figure out what, what to do with them. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of this came from. We spent a lot of time cleaning our mushrooms and then studying how to, how to preserve them and enjoy them year round. Um, and after doing that for a few years and picking a lot of people's brains, we kind of, uh, a publisher called us and said, would you like to uh, write a cookbook? And we were like, sure. And then we, you know, put it together. We're not chefs. We're not mycologists. We're not writers. It, it turned out to be a big job. Um, uh, so we, we went out and interviewed 25 different foragers and got lots of good information from them, filled in a lot of our blind spots, and they all gave us these really good recipes. Um, that are pretty accessible. That was one of our, our asks that, you know, give us recipes that we can cook ourselves. Um, and uh, uh, we cooked up all the recipes and wrote a lot about the mushrooms. And, and I think one of the ways the book is different is it's very mushroom centric. Most cookbooks are like appetizer, entree, dessert centric, and ours are organized by mushrooms. So you might find a dessert in the middle of the book with, with, a, with a mushroom. Um, but but each mushroom has its own set of recipes. And, and that's kind of one of our, our guiding philosophies are that, that you know, some, mushroom, some recipes work great for a lot of mushrooms, but uh, we try to find the, the right recipe for each mushroom. So we, we focused a lot on that on this book, as well as how to preserve large harvest of your mushrooms. Oh. Um, I just wanted to pop in and say hi. I'm hi. actually going to go to a new computer and man the chat, and I'm going to let Trent um, do most of this presentation. But if you guys have any questions, I will be watching the chat. I am going to support Trent with links if he needs, et cetera, et cetera, and try to answer your questions. So hello. Thank you for having us. We appreciate you so much. And we hope to be back to the Allegheny sometime soon because it was one of our favorite trips. Awesome. It was yeah. awesome. Those entolomas, oh my gosh, you guys. Goodness, it was our first time finding them. They're so weird. <laughs> anyway, hi, bye. Yeah, so we were, we were out there two years ago for the, uh, that must have been the 2019 Gary Linkoff foray up in Cook Forest. Uh, what an event. It was such a nice time to be there and we met so many people and you guys have such an impressive mycological society. We, you know, went out and picked and came back and oh my gosh, there was like Adam and Garrett, and John, and I don't know who else around the table. Idine mushrooms, uh, so many experts. Um, although we we quickly discovered the the secret, which is you don't have to hang at the ID table. Just go hang out in the in the kind of covered covered patio area there, where the spouses and significant others are hanging out. Where we we quickly made friends with them and and uh, 
um, got lots of lots of great ideas. And um, uh, even uh, Danielle, we met Danielle there, and she's featured in the cookbook. She's one of the 25 foragers. And uh, Danielle has some awesome recipes. Uh, specifically, I think our favorite in there is a pate recipe, which is like a go-to, bring it to Thanksgiving dinner, vegan pate made with mushrooms. And it is absolutely delicious. I don't know if Danielle is on here or not, but that recipe is like worth the price of admission for the book. It is so good. We're so grateful she shared it. Uh, if you come to any place we are Thanksgiving dinner, you will find that pate because I think we make it every year now uh, for Thanksgiving. Uh, it's so good. So there we go. Um, what a what a great group you guys have. So many so many experts and so much going on and the badges. What a neat idea. So I guess from here, I'll jump in. Uh, again, chat, we love the chat. Uh, this is a good time to kind of pop in there and ask questions. We'll be watching it. Hopefully you guys can see me okay and, and hear me okay. Um, uh, I think this is on Facebook too. Um, I, got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of topics to cover here um, uh, and, and, and about preservation and some big ones like dehydration or freezing, but some, some fun smaller uh, more specialized tech techniques as well. I kind of want to start with, uh, with, with this. Um, I, I think this is the enemy of preservation. And you guys know what I'm holding up here. This is a Ziploc bag. And they're great for short-term storage. Um, but I don't know if you know, this plastic is, is pretty breathable. And ultimately, when you store food in these, uh, your food does not last as long. And, and that's why you know, when you go to the grocery store, they don't sell food uh, packaged uh, professionally in this. They have a higher quality plastic. So the first advice is if you can get out of the Ziploc bags and maybe look at, at like a bag like this, which is a, a, a vacuum seal freezer bag. Um, I, I like these, they're pre-cut. I have like three sizes ready to go. Um, and, and when you put your food in here, this, this plastic is, is not very permeable. So you can freeze it or, or keep it on the shelf and it will last longer. Now, glass is great. You can store your, your mushrooms in glass jars as well, especially the dried ones. Uh, the, the, the problem there is you don't wanna freeze them that way. So, so the bags are, are nice for freezing. So I, I love these bags. Um, if you want a, a slightly longer storage life, um, this is a fun one. These are Mylar bags. I don't use these for mushrooms necessarily. They're kind of expensive, but uh, these have no, uh, no air or oxygen will move in, will move between this product, this mylar, and your, your food will last as long as it can last in this. If you're, if you're like prepping and you want to save food for 25 years, this is the, this is the right product right here. Um, now, I love these too for, for preserving my mushrooms. These are two different things. So you're going to want to kind of be savvy about the difference. This is a desiccant pouch. It's food safe. Uh, this is not the one that I took out of like a pair of tennis shoes. Um, I bought these on Amazon and they come in a bag of, you know, a couple hundred, 500, whatever you want. And if you drop these into your dried mushrooms, they will help protect them in case you have a mushroom that's not completely dry and they're super cheap. So I almost always drop these into my dried mushrooms um, just to protect them just in case. The other thing, though, I think is a little more unusual are these. These are oxygen scrubbers. Um, they, they somehow chemically remove the oxygen from the, the environment that they're put in. Now, I've had this one sitting out on the counter for a half hour now. It's gone bad. It's probably, you know, pulling the oxygen out of the air. Um, but what I do with this is I put this into products that I want to keep for really long-term storage. So often what I'll do is I'll, uh, let me grab one here. Here are black trumpets. I store them in this bag um, and I have vacuum sealed it. I'm gonna talk about the vacuum in a minute. And then I put the pouch right here and that's gonna pull the oxygen more out of the air and it's gonna keep the product fresher for longer. Now, eventually then, I'm going to uh, transfer that into, you know, a glass jar like this, maybe. Uh, these are morels. And uh, where, where they sit on my counter and I can eat them. So after I eat this jar, I might go get another bag from the back and refill it, feeling like the bags are my long-term storage. If I don't eat that mushroom for 10 years, that's great. And then in the bottom of this, I will put 
uh, desiccants just to keep it dry, just in case. And well, Colorado is a moist environment, but some places are more humid. And that will help keep these fresh for maybe the year it takes me to eat through these. Um, so I, I would recommend you try the, the, these uh, O2 scrubbers if you're able to. The other thing that is going to make um, your, your product last a lot longer is vacuum sealing it. And whether it's frozen or dehydrated, uh, if, if you can remove the air, it really does enhance the shelf life, um, especially you'll notice on mushrooms that are more um, sensitive, especially to smell. Uh, now we don't usually dry chanterelles, but say matsutake, uh, which I don't think you guys get in Pennsylvania. It's really evident if you if you dehydrate some in a jar and you and you dehydrate some and vacuum seal them a year or two later, the the smell is significantly fresher on the ones that have been vacuum sealed. So we uh, let me show you the vacuum seal. Um, you can start with the bag I showed you, and you can have a vacuum seal machine, and you know you can buy those all over the place, and it will it will suck the air out of uh, one of those bags. I don't know how I lost the bag right here just now. It will suck the air out of these bags. But one of the things we've been using a lot recently, especially as we travel, is we also will get these bags, which look like Ziplocs, but they have a higher quality plastic, and they have a little a little hole right here. And you can grab it. You basically take one of these little uh, portable units, which has that, and you listen to it. Oops. And you can put it right on this hole and suck the air out of a, a, a kind of more of a traditional Ziploc bag. And then you can reuse these bags, which is nice. Uh, they are kind of pricey. However, my favorite thing I will show you now is uh, I have some vacuum sealed mushrooms here. I'm just going to open them up and you can hear this. All right? Did you guys hear that? That open up? What I do to vacuum seal in mason jars to again increase the shelf life is one of these, which are uh, you know available on Amazon. It's an attachment. This one is built for the uh, mason wide mouth, and you just put it right on here like this, slide it on, and then you put this on the top. I'll do it real quick. <laughs> And that sucked the air out of this. And then I can carefully take this off and it's vacuum sealed again. And there's no, you know, you can't push it in. I could pop it off again and show you. But if you look in here, you can see right there at the top, there's my little O2 scrubber as well. So this is kind of put away for long-term storage. And these are chanterelles. I'm gonna talk about how I did those in a minute. Um, so I really like this vacuum sealing apparatus. I use it for a lot of different things and, and just getting the oxygen away from your product is, is going to increase the shelf life pretty nicely. Um, do they make plastic storage bags that decompose yet? No, they do not. And I don't know if they would last for storing food anyways. Um, and that's a, you know, a reason to stick with glass. I think the problem is, we, you know, we just, you don't have the storage space for glass jars. So we've gone with the plastic for the long-term storage, but glass works great. Um, however, the one draw downside is I don't know how to vacuum seal this jar. You'd have to get a special lid. I think uh, I would have to invest in a lot more mason jars I could vacuum seal. Uh, but th this is a good, a good technique to use on mason jars if you want to keep them that way instead of in plastic. Um, however, I will also note these plastic bags are reusable. Um, you just, after you seal them, you cut the top off and you can keep reusing them. They get a little bit smaller every time. Um, but it's surprising even when they're half full, there's still a use for bags that are that big for your smaller, little smaller sets of mushrooms. All right, so that was that was plastic. I just wanted to talk about the kind of the product there. Now, as I, I'm going to I'm going to talk about freeze drying next. It's kind of a fun, more modern way to preserve. Um, um, and to do that, I think before what I'd like to do is kind of throw in some fun alternatives along the way. So I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to jump right in with a fun one because I'm thirsty. Um, this is a preservation technique. Here's, a, here's a, a jar. This is called shrub. Now this happens to be Matsutake shrub and it is uh, a year and a half old. Um, so it lasts a long time. It's been in my fridge, but basically shrub is a drinking vinegar and, and I drink a lot of it. So I've got a glass of ice here and I'm just gonna put some soda water in it and show you. Sorry about all the loud noise. 
bet you guys can hear that real well, the pouring of the soda water. And then you just take a little bit of this, this shrub and pour it in and it's called a drinking vinegar. And um, it's, I think maybe traditionally a colonial thing and it's been making a comeback recently in the US, especially in bars to make fancy mixed drinks with, but there it is, it's a soda. It's sweet and it's sour and it's very Matsutake. Um, this technique to make shrub works very well with chanterelle as well. It makes an absolute delicious shrub, especially if you pick your more fragrant um, species and make it out of. And all, all you do, and the recipe is in the book, but to make it, we take half water and half vinegar, or excuse me, half vinegar and half sugar in equal amounts. We cook that up, we, we boil it, and we throw in an equal amount of mushrooms. We simmer it for, I don't know, 15 minutes. One third, well, that's one third, one third, one third, isn't it? Yeah, Kristen just corrected me on that. That's one third mushrooms, one third vinegar, one third sugar. Cook it for 15 minutes, strain out the mushrooms. And what you have is a really a delightful drink. Chanterelle shrub is pretty delish. You can mix fruit in that way. We do a lot of fruit shrubs as well um, to, to have alternatives to alcoholic drinks. Um, and when we do it, the other, the other tip, I really like champagne vinegar. I really like the flavor. You can use any vinegar. However, it is going to take on the flavor of the vinegar. So use one you like, and you might want to use more of a premium one like champagne vinegar, if, if whatever, depending what you like. Um, it really is quite nice, sour and sweet, and, hmm, really good. All right, so that shrub, a good way to preserve there your chanterelles or matsutakis. Um, I don't think we've used any other mushrooms on the shrub though, just those two. So let's talk about freeze drying first as like this big mm, preservation technique and freeze drying is kind of new on the scene. Um, and the reason is historically freeze dry machine, drying machines were tens of thousands of dollars and they were available in commercial food packing plants. Um, where they would freeze dry product. Well, over the last couple of years, there's a new company called Harvest Right that has released a consumer level uh, freeze drying machine. Let, let me show that to you. Um, give me just a second here and I will show you a picture of that. Okay, so here it is. Um, this is a picture of a freeze drying machine sitting on a stainless steel counter. Now this is not my garage. Mine looks very similar to this. My garage is not quite as clean though. Um, and it looks like a little refrigerator. It will hold uh, four trays of product, it's, it's, but it's pretty good size. And over to the right over here, if you look to the right of the machine, there's an air compressor. And that's part of the equipment, this air compressor. So let me come back here now and talk about the process, uh, if I can figure out how to get back. Uh, huh. Oh, there it is. All right, I'm back. Um, oh yeah, so here's the trays that go on right here. And the, the, my machine holds four of these trays and uh, that each tray holds about this much product. So I can, I can run about four quarts generally at a time uh, in the machine. So when you run a freeze dryer, uh, forgetting, let's just talk about advantages and disadvantages before I kind of break into it. First of all, the disadvantages, the machines are expensive. They're 2000 to $3,000 to buy the equipment. Um, they take about a day and a half, about 36 hours to run through a batch. So it's kind of a slow process. You can only run about four quarts of product when it's done. So it's, you, you can't bulk produce. And then finally, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of loud because you're running an air compressor the whole time and it uses a fair bit of electricity. So it's not this highly, it's not energy efficient. It has some real downsides. Um, the upside of freeze drying, uh, there's probably three. Number one is, uh, when you freeze dry food, it will last a long time, as in 25 years, very long shelf life compared to any other thing you can do, especially if you pack it in that Mylar bag I showed you earlier. Um, number two is it's, it's, it's shelf stable. So even though you use a lot of energy initially to, to preserve it, it will sit on your shelf and you don't have to use any more energy to keep it preserved. Now combine that with number three is it will allow you to preserve 
mushrooms that are normally not good dried and they're very nice freeze dried. So the classic example is chanterelles. If you want to preserve chanterelles for multiple years, you, you really all you can do is either freeze them, which isn't going to last multiple years probably. And, and then you got to keep them in the freezer or you can dehydrate them. And that's just not very good. Dehydrated chanterelles are, are not that tasty. So they're going to, the, the freeze dryer will allow you to uh, use mushrooms and, and dry them in a way that normally you couldn't dry. So another benefit, and this is two in one here. See, can, I'll just open this up and show you. Can you guys tell what mushroom that is? I'll show you another one. Chat, go ahead and type it in the chat if you know. Here's a slightly smaller one. Here's the inside of it. It's, and I think you guys probably know what that is, right? Yeah, let's see. Has anybody got it in there? Let me roll the chat up and see. Yeah, shaggy mane. That's right. It's a shaggy mane. What is that? Caprinus commodus? I don't know if that's how you say it or if I got it right. I'll let you tell me if I'm right. I'm, I'm, that's not my specialty. Um, but I think, you know, if you've, if you've, if you've harvested these, they are impossible to preserve drying. I mean, as soon as you pick them, they start to go bad. And if you dry them, they're, it's a pretty miserable experience. But if you freeze dry them, A, they're going to last forever in here. But did you see how pretty they were? How they didn't change color. They kept their size. They kept their shape. They kept their smell. Oh, this is not the greatest smelling mushroom, but when you smell matsutakis or chanterelles or morels, they smell just perfect. So you get a really, just dropping everything here. You get a really nice product when you freeze dry that is really pretty. People wow about it. And then when you cook with it, you get just introduce water really quickly. These will rehydrate in like one minute. Um, and they tend to be a little soggy when you rehydrate them. They'll take on a little too much water. So often I will then dry pan saute them dry to kind of help the water release. But the flavor is generally really nice in, in freeze dried products. So I like to do it with these, which are, there's no other way to preserve it. It's like a totally a win-win if you want to preserve uh, uh, shaggy maize. Uh, here's another good example. Um, I'll fold these up. I'm sure you can guess what these are too. Look at how perfectly white those are. And I'll hold up another one. How they keep their nice orange color. So they're beautiful. You guys know what those are, right? Cut up lobster mushrooms. Um, and here's a whole jar. And they smell just like lobster mushrooms, kind of like fresh, but that little bit of kind of fishy smell that you get, the sea, sea, seafood smell you get with lobster mushrooms. Um, and they've kept their shape and color very nicely. I'm just gonna put these back. And I have my little pouch in there, out right under the lid, my special little pouch. I'll close that back up. And then I'll, I'll uh, vacuum seal that later. Sometimes you can do like morels. I think this is a good example. Um, these are just beautiful, they're big. They smell good. Oh, you heard that. That was well vacuum sealed. Here's a little nice little baby. And it just really looks nice. It's a nice product. Um, now, the funny thing is, I don't recommend this. Some mushrooms are really just nicely, they just taste great dried. And I think morels are a good example of, they're so good dried that why would you do this? It just seems like a lot of extra expense. And we just do it because it's kind of fun. They're pretty to look at, but I don't feel like they're any better than morels when they're, when they're freeze dried this way. So let me set this over here and talk about what I, what I like to do and, and not do with um, the freeze dryer. I have found that some mushrooms I prefer and we prefer dried and we don't freeze dry. They're not as good. Specifically, we have had bad luck with yellow feet um, and black trumpets aren't as good either, but we feel like they're really good dry. The craterellus, is it tubiformis there? Or do you have another craterellus? Um, so I, I tend to dry the craterellus species. Is it craterellus tubiformis that you have there for yellow feet or do you have a slightly different species? You can type it in there if you know. Um, uh, um, other, other ones are just really good freeze dry. Matsutake, chanterelle are just 
really good freeze dried. Uh, we also freeze dry a lot of porcini. And the reason is um, porcini change their flavor when you dry them and they're really nice dried and they're really easy to freeze too. But if you freeze dry porcini, porcini, they taste fresh. So here's another example of a fun application. Here's a jar. I'm just gonna pull one out. We take just the, the perfect little, uh, the perfect little porcini buttons. Look at that little baby. You know, that's like nice. And you can find little baby porcini smaller than golf bar, balls. Those are like the best things. And we slice them real thin and we freeze dry them. And you can just eat them, they're raw and they taste like fresh porcini, they're really nice. Um, so I keep a little jar of these as, as a fun little addition uh, to add to food um, and, they're, and they're kind of fun. We use our freeze dryer. I mean, I don't think it makes sense just for mushrooms. We use it a lot for uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, food out of our garden, as well as other, other foraged foods. Uh, you know, like we've had really good luck with foraged apricots, uh, foraged asparagus, um, uh, but even simple things like grapes. And uh, you can freeze dry all your used uh, fresh herbs and spices. So when you buy those and they're starting to go bad in your fridge, if you freeze dry them and then you put them in a jar, you pretty much have fresh mint or fresh whatever it is that you have, tarragon or parsley, right in a jar that you can cook with that tastes pretty fresh, even though it's been in your cupboard for a year. So it works pretty well. Does, the freeze, does it shrink the mushroom? No, uh, and um, the freeze dryer only shrinks the mushroom like a very small amount, like 10%. So you don't really notice it keeps its size and its shape and usually its color, depending on the mushroom. I have seen, these are, these are chanterelles here. I showed you these earlier and they're just like, freeze dried chanterelles and they're just perfect. They, they, they do get a little, if you look, they're a little paler than they used to be, but they smell good and they taste good and they'll cook up really close to fresh. Uh, what are the two little preservation bags you asked? Uh, this one is an O2 scrubber, oxygen scrubber. And I just got it on Amazon. And the other one is just a desiccant pouch. Both are food safe. So you can, they can touch your food. They're not gonna hurt it. Um, Ignicolor. Oh, is that the other? Is that the other Craterellis called Craterellis Ignicolor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just seeing if I've answered everybody's questions. Good. Any? If you have any more questions on freeze drying, now is a good time. Um, another one of our favorite uses of the freeze dryer is to make uh, uh, stock and tea. So I have here. An example, basically, you know, you take all your, your leftover mushroom bits when you're cleaning mushrooms and you can dry them, you can freeze them, you can cook them into stock right away. You kind of cook that down into a, a heavy stock and strain it. And so then you've got this really good liquid. Traditionally, we would freeze that um, soup stock to, to add uh, back into food during the winter. But if you freeze dry your, your stock, it turns into this powder that is like bouillon and you can just put a, a teaspoon of this right into a cup of water and you have basically stock that's very mushroomy. Um, and it's fun, you can have really specialized stock. This is, a, this is actually Matsutake stock, but I have like porcini stock for instance. And it's very convenient, this should last forever in this jar. Um, and I like it because I just keep it on the counter and I can st stick my teaspoon or tablespoon in here and throw it into whatever food I'm cooking and get some instant umami and instant mushroom flavor. Uh, from that. Now, this is the final thing I want to show you with the freeze dryer. This is chaga. So we took, ch we took chaga, we ground it up, we simmered it in water, and then we made a, a really dense tea. And normally you would make that dense tea and then you could enjoy it for a week in your fridge. However, if you freeze dry it, you can just take this uh, out with a spoon and put it right into hot water and it, it acts like uh, freeze, like, like instant coffee. It doesn't take very much and it instantly turns your, your water into chaga tea, which is also a very convenient. Um, and, and we love to have, you know, I don't want to say fresh. We, we make chaga tea regularly. Uh, we're, we're, we're big fans of it. We love the flavor. And, um, um, and you know, we don't always ha have it fresh made. So we have our freeze dried version on the side. And it's just really convenient to make a, a cup of chaga tea at night with, with, this, uh, with this freeze dried 
stuff. So you, you can do a lot of fun things with a freeze dryer if you get it and you're kind of willing to accept the, the noise the pri and the price of, of running it. So that's freeze drying. Does that, I'm curious if any of you are in the chat here. Do any of you have a freeze dryer um, uh, and have been using it? Um, it's kind of a newer thing. It, you know, certainly happening more and more. Um, I think the other challenge for us is we make a lot of snacks is sometimes the freeze dryer stuff sticks in your teeth. So we found some fruits like bananas, like you freeze dry a banana and eat it. It's like stuck in your teeth, like taffy for an hour. So we don't do bananas, but strawberries, oh my gosh. And peaches. Wow. They're so good. Freeze dried. Um, People just love them. Also, we freeze dry uh, sour things get really sour. So if you freeze dry lemons, like a half a, a slice of a lemon and you eat it again, your whole face will be like pucker up. Similarly, it brings out the sweetness and fruits. Uh, if there is uh, grapes will be really sweet, watermelon really sweet, and it will bring out the acidity in, in or excuse me, the hotness in, in hot foods like jalapeno peppers get really hot. Okay, I'm kind of, I'm kind of meandering here. So uh, I'm done with talking about freeze dry unless anybody has some more questions. I'm gonna jump to another little favorite technique and then I'm gonna talk about dehydrating, which is not like a sexy topic, uh, but it's worth talking about. Uh, here's a bag of fun product. Uh, this, is, this is jerky. And this happens to be uh, oyster mushroom jerky. And oh my gosh, it is so good. I don't understand why this is not in the shelves and stores everywhere. I think people just love meat and now they have like turkey jerky. Well, uh, we make jerky out of chanterelles, hedgehogs and oysters. And what those all have in common are, we get a whole bunch of them, we don't know what to do with them. They don't really dry well, any of them. So it's not like easy to put aside a whole bag of them. You can freeze them for sure. Um, but with the jerky, we basically take the mushroom, we boil it for know, a few minutes. It just shrinks the mushrooms down. They're cooked. And then we, we marinate them in the jerky seasoning. Now we have, I don't know, three or four jerky seasoning recipes in the book. You can make your own up. Um, after they marinate overnight, we put them back in the dehydrator. Well, not back for the first time in the dehydrator. And we dehydrate them probably four hours until they're still a little soft. We don't want to make them too crunchy. Um, we try to cut them all the same size so we don't get bad, like wet middle parts. And then we put them back in a bag and they tend to all get back to the same level of moisture where they're not crunchy. They're pretty chewy. They have a delightful texture. The flavor is awesome, awesome, awesome. And if it's not awesome, it's because your marinade wasn't awesome. You needed maybe a little more sugar, a little more soy, a little more spice. Whatever it is you like, you can go, you can go teriyaki style, or you can go smoky style, or whatever it is you're into. Oh, it's so good! And now I finally can eat a lot of oyster mushrooms. I've never been a big fan. I cultivate mushrooms, and what do you do with cultivated oyster mushrooms? I mean, how many can you really eat? This will be gone in a couple of days. I mean, we eat the heck out of this. It does not last. Um, it seems to be shelf stable, although I've never kept it very long on the shelf to say, would it last a year? I think so, but I couldn't say for sure. Um, see if we have any questions. So again, uh, if you get a big chanterelle, hedgehog or oyster harvest, I would recommend you start trying to jerky them because it is like too darn good. Um, really delicious. All right. So let's talk about dehydrating. Um, uh, pros of dehydrating are it's super cheap. Um, uh, uh, you have, you have great shelf like storage life on dehydrated products. The cons are that some mushrooms don't taste good dehydrated and you kind of got to learn the hard way or listen to people. Um, and you'll find that especially the texture of the mushrooms often is not as good after they're dehydrated. So what do, what mushrooms do we dehydrate? I think with a passion, we dehydrate morels and yellow feet and black trumpets, we think they're absolutely delicious, dehydrated. Um, we dehydrate porcini, we enjoy those a lot, and candy caps, which I guess you don't have. Um, maitake, we will also uh, dehydrate. Um, our least favorite, I think, are chicken of the woods, uh, chanterelles or hedgehogs aren't very good dehydrated, and lion's mane or heresiums also are, are poor when they're, when they're dehydrated in our experience. Um, now the technique we use is pretty simple. And I, I think this is interesting. Uh, I, I hear, 
it seems like a lot of people, especially on social media, are always advising you dehydrate at lower temperatures because you're you're ruining your food, and and it's almost a black or white thing. It's not really been my experience. Um, I usually dehydrate at just a standard temperature. The dehydrator throws off. Um, that might be 140 or 150. Um, and I dehydrate until the food is cracker dry. And that, that's important that it has to be cracker dry where it snaps a little bit. If it's bendy or soft, you're gonna put that in a jar and it's gonna, it's gonna go bad. So you do have to dehydrate all the way. Now the temperature I use, um, I, I'm gonna show you a dehydrator. There's all kinds of dehydrators on the market. Um, you know, uh, uh, we use only the kind of cheap big box dehydrators. Um, uh, you can go from there all the way to, to Excalibur level machines that are expensive. Um, I don't know that you, you, they're worth the money or not. Um, I buy, I'm just gonna show you. It's a little dirty because we ran our, our jerky through this a couple of days ago. Um, I just buy this from like Walmart or whatever. And I want to point out, it doesn't have any settings. This particular model, they make another one that has settings, which is a temperature and a timer. And I kind of like the one with the settings so I can adjust the temperature if I want. Um, what I like about this particular model, and this is the only reason why I'm not saying it's better, is it comes with these trays that, that, that stack. And so they take up a very small amount of space, um, but then you flip them and that's how you stack them. You flip them like that. And they, and they go from taking up oh, sorry, only a little amount of space to you can stack these like 12 high in your dehydrator. And you can dehydrate a lot in the dehydrator. And my experience is I usually set the temperature so that the mushrooms will be finished overnight. Um, and so if I'm doing petite mushrooms that are not real big and I don't have a lot of them, I'll lower the dehydrator down to 95 degrees. Um, if I'm doing a, a 12 racks of, of chunky morels, I'll, I'll raise it up to 150 or 160. Um, and that's what it takes to get done overnight. I usually rotate my trays halfway through just to get a more even process. And I think maybe that's the advantage of a more expensive machine. You don't have to rotate um, uh, to, to get a consistent one. But I usually adjust the temperature uh, to, to get the product done in about eight hours to 12 hours overnight. Um, and uh, if I do, if I am worried about the temperature too high, I'll run it hot until they've gotten close to dry and then I'll bring it back down maybe the last couple hours to kind of polish them off at a lower temperature. Um, I'm not, I don't really think that doing it at 140 or 145 like this unit does by default has, is, I think that's just fine for the food. I do think it's fully nutritious. Um, uh, what do you say? Oh, be careful with eating oyster mushrooms. They're 2% lovastatin by dry weight, the cholesterol lowering chemical to develop muscle pain. I did not realize that, Glenn. Um, it definitely, did. I don't develop muscle pain from these, but um, I, maybe I don't eat enough. I might have to eat more oysters to see if, I, if that impacts me. Um, I've never really enjoyed oyster mushrooms that much um, until I started making jerky out of them where I found I really enjoy eating the jerky. It makes a great snack. Um, yeah, but doesn't heat destroy some of the constituents of the fruit? I mean, yeah, and, and that's what people say. Then there's some studies out there where they've done it with shiitake and oyster mushrooms. And usually about 140, I think, is the number to 150, those studies test. And, and does it destroy the constituents? I mean, yeah, a little bit. I think if you look at the numbers, I'm not like, it's not like you're eating cardboard if you do it over 150. I mean, probably any sort of dehydrating can, can change the chemical makeup of a mushroom. I'm just not convinced that people that tell you they you're dehydrating at too hot a temperature, they know what they're talking about or that it really matters. But you know, do the research on your own. Um, I think a conventional dehydrator works great. Um, let's see what else I've got in here. Oh, a, a couple of other kind of fun tips or techniques. One, one thing you can do, especially if you want to maybe increase the the nutritional quality of your, your mushrooms is to put them out in the sun for a little while. Um, mushrooms obviously create a, a tremendous amount of vitamin D when they're exposed to the sun. Now the test they've done on these, I think they did them with, with commercially grown shiitakes and I think they turned them upside down. It was the gills that needed to be exposed to the sun for that to happen. I don't know if there's the you know, wild mushrooms, they're already out in the wild where they get some sunlight, maybe they already have the vitamin D, but I love to put my mushrooms out in the sun for a while and get them started in the sun. Um, some mushrooms really just 
taste really good that way and dehydrate up a little quicker. Morels and porcini, for instance, other mushrooms I've tried and they haven't really helped them. I think I've had some bad luck with black trumpets, sun drying or air drying at first because they, they got a little weird. Um, uh, so I don't know if it works with all mushrooms. Um, so Glenn, uh, uh, Glenn, you're concerned about higher temperatures, removing volatile constituents. The longer you dry and the higher the temperature, the more the flavor components are likely to be lost. I'm, perhaps, I'm, I think the way that we're talking about, de, you know, dehydrating them till they're crack or dry um, around 140 or 145. Um, I don't think it does that. That's, I've been eating mushrooms my whole life, not life, but since I've been doing this that way, and I, I think they're great. So I don't think you'll have a problem. Um, and maybe that's a reason, Glenn, why you want to tell people like, yeah, don't use your oven. Don't put them in a 200 degree oven. You're going to get a weird product in there if you do it that way. Um, don't dehydrate wet mushrooms. If you, if you do wash your mushrooms, and we're mushroom washers, it's a philosophical thing. We will frequently wash them if they're dirty. Um, um, but not all mushrooms, but we do wash a fair number. As long as you wash your mushrooms and then put them back out like on your counter on trays and bring them back to their original moisture levels, they too tend to dehydrate pretty well. If you if you wash them and put them in a dehydrator wet, it will often really wreck the mushrooms. Morels are, are a classic example of that. If you wash them and put them right in the dehydrator, they get like black and nasty. Um, so you're going to, you're going to want to, you're going to want to wash them, but then let them sit for a couple hours out and get back to their original kind of moisture levels before you dehydrate. So that, that's what I prefer to do there. Um, but that is a quick way to ruin a lot of mushrooms is, is do them wet. Um, you can now, let's talk about rehydration. Um, I, 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 we usually rehydrate by uh, pouring uh, boiling water on our mushrooms, which is the fastest. And within about 15 minutes, they're usually rehydrated. We strain the water out. We try to cook with the water um, if we can. Um, and the recipe, because there's a lot of flavor in it. Um, however, you can use cool or lukewarm water. It just takes a little bit longer and, and indeed might be a superior way to do it. I don't know that my palate has ever sensed a difference between a, 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 that technique of rehydrating. Um, the other thing, again, you want to save your water if possible. One of the really great ways to rehydrate your mushrooms if they're clean is you put them right in the pan, the saute pan. You put some water on them and you put some oil in with them and then you cook them for like 15 minutes. And what you're doing is you're cooking the water off, right? And when they're done, the reason you put the oil in or the butter or whatever, uh, when they're when the water's done and the oil hits the pan, the noise changes and you'll hear it. You'll hear it. You'll hear it cooking. Then it'll start sizzling a little bit, and then you know you're ready to start cooking. The mushrooms are done. If you don't put the, the butter in and you're not paying attention, they'll they'll start to burn and you won't hear it. It'll just you'll be like, oh my gosh, I just burnt my mushrooms. Um, so I really like to do that, and I like to do that when I'm trying to keep my flavor of the water of the mushrooms in the food versus letting it escape into the water. In fact, if you if you rehydrate like morels overnight or mushrooms, um, they'll even they'll give a lot of their flavor into the water, and you can have really flavorful water if that's what your recipe calls for. Um, but we do even have a recipe in the book where that's what it calls for: rehydrate the mushrooms overnight so you can make a. Um, a liquid that's very flavorful. Um, I would, I like to do the cooking in the pan and that puts all the flavor back into the mushrooms. I like to do that with also with my black trumpets, especially. And I think the reason is that black trumpet liquid is really black. And often I'm, when I'm cooking food, I don't want to have a, a, a cup of black liquid put back into my food because it affects the color of the food. I'll rehydrate my black trumpets with this pan rehydration technique. And I, I really like that technique. It's just kind of easy and, and classic uh, uh, to do. Um, what else do we have? So after we dehydrate, we store them either in high quality plastic or we put them in our, in our jars and we, we vacuum seal them if, if possible. Um, and we're really uptight about not having, we don't want one bad mushroom in here. No partially dehydrated mushrooms mixed into the, the batch or it will ruin them. Um, let's see. Yeah, so good, Kristen, you're talking in the chat a little bit about the oyster mushrooms. Um, 
we were lucky we we had a few foragers give us some really good oyster mushroom recipes that were really very different um and, and i think they really opened up some new kind of flavors for us they don't involve butter um, they're more asian inspired recipes and if you're looking for some some fun ways to cook up oysters i think you'll like the recipes in the book they're they're not your normal you know oyster mushroom recipes um all right i think we're good on dehydration maybe i'll jump into another little fun favorite food um here's this one here this is cocoa this is uh i'll call it chaga cocoa it's really medicinal mushroom cocoa and Kristen, if you can put the recipe in there that would be great it, it, we found it online from a uh, um, Wondersmith, she's a online personality who does a lot of crazy foraging and cooking. Well, she has a really just delightful chocolate recipe. And basically in a, 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 in the nutshell, she takes three or four types of medicinal mushrooms. Um, in this case, turkey tail, chaga, lion's mane, and um, I want to say artist conch. And she powders them up, soaks them in uh, brandy overnight, and then she takes that mixture and adds a bunch of fun kind of herbs and spices. Um, um, I don't know what they are offhand, cardamom and I don't know what else, and chocolate, good chocolate. And you cook that some more in a hot, in a, in a crock pot, get all the flavor going. Then you take this whole mess. At this point, it's like a, like a goopy, thick substance and you spread it in your dehydrator and you dehydrate it and then you take it out and put it in the blender one more time to break it down and what you end up with is this absolutely delightful hot chocolate it is uh it, it looks like chocolate but it's about i'm gonna guess about 50 percent cocoa and 50 percent mushroom i might be a little it's probably less mushroom it's but but when you put it in your in your in your cup and pour hot water into it we also add um um, coconut sugar and and some sort of fake milk to it. What fake milk do we add? Co coconut milk? Because we, do we don't really do dairy. Um, but you, you could use powdered milk and, and there you are, or real milk. Um, and you have a proper hot chocolate. And when you're done drinking that, there's a little bit of a um, powder in the bottom, a little bit left over because um, there are like mushroom bodies in there. Uh, but it's just a delightful way to, I think, enjoy some medicinal mushrooms. And we feel like, I think we have to make up a new batch every couple of weeks because we, we drink a lot of it. And I've, I, I really love it. So I would, I, would, I would encourage you, if you like hot chocolate, it's a really fun recipe to use your medicinal mushrooms for. All right, that was my quick aside before we go to the next topic, freezing. Any, any questions on that? Did you get the recipe in there okay, Kristen? Oh, look, there's all these messages. I wasn't seeing the chat. Uh, Joanne, I'm sorry, I missed that question. Dehydrated mushrooms should last like forever. I mean, 10, 15, 20, they last a long time. Um, they, their flavors will often evolve and improve and change over time too. Um, uh, I, I feel like dehydrated mushrooms, dehydrated mushrooms, you're just classics. The ones we dehydrate last a long time. Um, I don't know what the outer limit of it is, but it's a long time. Ooh, I like that uh, fluff. Chanterelles and morels rehydrate nicely in white wine. That seems like a nice tip. Also, people use stock uh, uh, to, to rehydrate in. And I've seen people do, um, especially uh, chicken of the woods, I've seen them rehydrate in that buttermilk to try to soften them up. All right. Um, yeah, you guys can, you have chaga there, don't you? And kind of some certain maybe hidden, uh, birch forest, you can find some occasional chaga. Yeah. Uh, we, we go up into like uh, upper Wisconsin and Minnesota where it's pretty rampant. So we have a, we have a nice little supply, fortunately. I think it's fun. It's like the only mushroom you can go hunt in the winter, isn't it? Chaga. Um, I use the word mushroom loosely. Um, yeah. And there's a lot on the market. There's a lot of ground chaga product if, if you're not able to find it. Yeah. It's very rare there. I, I, I hear you. Um, all right, so uh, next is freezing. Uh, we, we love to freeze mushrooms. Our, our freezer is full of them. Um, we find there's certain mushrooms that are just really good frozen. Um, now there's, there's basically four techs we use to freeze mushrooms. Uh, the first one is the simplest, it's just straight up raw, raw mushrooms. Uh, people always tell you not to freeze them. We've had good luck with a few types freezing them. 
Um, specifically, we will freeze morels raw. Um, some people like to like to like to prepare them for frying first. They'll roll them in flour before they freeze them raw. That that works. Um, we also do porcini and chicken of the woods raw. Um, and what, when we do freeze raw mushrooms like those, like morels or porcini or what have you, um, and if you're going to try it, I would I would recommend you try it. I think I think uh, ch chanterelles might work too, and hedgehogs. I don't know for sure. Um, the trick is when you freeze them is you, you cut them up and you spread them or in the case of morels, it might be whole. You spread them on a cookie tray and you put the whole tray into the freezer and you freeze them so they're not touching. You do that for two hours and then you take them out and only after you've, they're fully frozen do you actually bag them up. Um, here's an example. These are our fresh frozen porcini, which we have a lot of here. Um, and I really like the fresh frozen porcini. I love the way they, they taste and they, they, I basically thaw them for half an hour. So they're still pretty frozen. I put them right in the pan, half frozen. They cook up real nice. They release their liquid, they brown, they, they taste delicious. Um, so I don't know where, I don't know where this, you can't freeze mushrooms or you shouldn't. These are like awesome. Uh, morels, a lot of people freeze morels raw too. Now with chicken of the woods, I've been experimenting with that. I, I was pretty pleased with how well they froze raw. And then what I did was I, uh, um, when I, when I take them out of the freezer, I put them in boiling water for 20 minutes. Um, and we've been struggling with some um, uh, sensitivities to chickens and, you know, indigestion type things. I, I don't know. I haven't figured out what and where and how that happens exactly. But we, we do, I did boil them for like 20 minutes, worked pretty good. And they, and after that, then I cooked them up like normal and, and they were juicy and nice and they tasted pretty good uh, and it was convenient. Um, now that's one way, freeze raw. Normally when you freeze, you're going to cook your mushrooms first. Um, now there's, there's kind of three ways we cook our mushrooms before we freeze them. Sometimes we, we dry saute them. So we'll take like, in this case, a, a pretty moisture laden mushroom, like a, like a chanterelle. We will put them into a pan and saute them and they release all that liquid. And then as soon as they reabsorb the liquid in, in between when they've released it and when they've reabsorbed it, we pull it off, the, pull it off the stove bring it down to room temperature, put them in a bag and freeze them often in just a little bit of their own juice. Uh, we don't saute them until they're dry, like where they've reabsorbed all their moisture and started to brown. Um, but we do want them to release a fair bit of moisture and we freeze them that way. And chanterelles are, are pretty good um, and, and hedgehogs too, if you treat them this way. Um, with the, with the, I will call it the dry saute. You can regular saute other mushrooms that maybe don't have as much moisture. You know, that's where you're gonna put butter in them and, and, and actually brown them. Um, I would do that with often like, let's say porcinis before I freeze them. Now the third way, I'm not sure which way this was. Uh, here's, here's some like frozen porcinis. Now I like, I, like to sa I, like to, I like to saute them instead of raw because um, they take up so much less space. So this is a lot of mushrooms compared to the raw type, they, they lose so much volume when you cook them. The other thing I wanna point out, I use the same bag and see how flat they are. If you pack your mushrooms in bags like this, especially if they're the same size and then freeze them purposefully quite flat, when they're done, you can turn them sideways and you can line them up in your freezer like books or stack them vertically and they take up way less space. If you're kind of haphazard about freezing them in different size bags, you can't, you can't store them near as efficiently in your freezer. So that's, that's a nice tip if you get into this habit of always making them nice and flat and same size bags, you can save a lot of room in your freezer. Uh, but these, I think what I did for bigger batches, and this is also how I like to do my heresiums. Um, I like to roast them. I like to put them in a cookie tray instead of sauteing them. And, and I think the reason is it dries them out real nice. The heresium has so much liquid in them. So when you roast them, it will, uh, I, what's the word for that when you brown them? Is it the Maillard effect or Mayo, something like that. It gives them a really nice flavor when they're roasted, which means roasted means like 400 degrees at least in an oven, it browns them up. They release their liquid. And the other advantage is when you've got a lot, you can roast like cookie trays worth, it's so much faster than sauteing. So if you have a big batch, roasting is the way to go. It's fast. It does give them a little extra flavor. Um, and for some mushrooms like lion's mane, it is my preferred way to freeze them. Um, I also do that same technique with uh, oyster mushrooms because you get those big batches, you roast them and freeze them. Um, 
no, that was old. And now I just make jerky at them because I like it so much more. Um, let's see what else we got here for freezing. Um, Oh, Matsutake are also pretty good frozen. Although, I mean, excuse me, my Taki, I misspoke. Um, I, I will typically blanch those before I freeze them. Although I, th I feel like the my Taki is kind of like a morel or a porcini. It's forgiving. You can do a lot of different things with it. You can, you can pickle it, you can freeze it, you can dehydrate it, you can freeze dry it. Like it's pretty good all ways. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty forgiving mushroom. Um, so I can't say, you know, and maybe you guys have, you have a lot of my Taki down there, I'm thinking. Um, probably a lot more than we have. So you probably have a lot of experience with how to preserve maitake. Uh, for us, they're like a treat when we can get fresh maitake and we have to come to places like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin to try to find them. So I don't, I don't have as much direct experience with preserving the maitake. Can you make maitake jerky? I will bet, Matthew, it would be awesome to make maitake jerky. Um, just like my Taki pickle is pretty good. Um, I, yeah, mushroom ice cream. We actually have a recipe in the book for chanterelle uh, sorbet, um, which is really quite nice. Um, uh, we, we like it. I, I like to make chanterelle sorbet. I don't have any now. I, I, I tend to make it with fresh chanterelles. Um, it does taste a little better, although you could use frozen for sure. Um, all right. Good. I think I've got those questions answered. Oh yeah. Candy cap ice cream would be great too. That's the one thing like people in the East and Midwest, like there's no access to candy caps locally. And those are such a fun mushroom to, to get. If you ever get a chance to go out West and pick candy caps, um, they're a really neat mushroom just from a, a chef standpoint or a kitchen standpoint, you can do so many, so many fun things with, uh, with candy caps. Um, and on that note, here is, here is a uh, bourbon. Is it bourbon? Yeah, I think it's bourbon. I don't know what kind of alcohol with candy caps in it. And it used to be full. Um, now it's, it's mostly gone. I think most of it actually made, we made whipped cream. We always make whipped cream out of this uh, candy cap bourbon, but it's kind of fun. You can suffuse uh, bourbon with it, or you can do vodka and chanterelles too, if, if you're so inclined. Okay. Oh, Garrett's on there. Hi, Garrett. All right. Um, what do we have next? Uh, how about something fun? And then we'll talk about pickling, although pickling is pretty fun. Uh, before I talk about pickling, I'm going to show you this. Um, we do this, uh, I would say every year, except here in Colorado, we've had now three dry years in a row. Um, so I only have a little bit left from, this is like from two or three years ago. Um, this is chanterelle jam, um, which is really delightful. Um, uh, we use the jam to make, I, I'm not quite sure the name, it's in the book, it's the recipes in the book, but basically you take wheels of brie and you, you carve out a hole in the middle and you put jam in it and then you wrap it in dough and then you bake it. And when you take it out of the oven and cut it, like the brie oozes out and the jam oozes out and it's like really quick and easy to make because uh, you buy the dough and the yeah, I guess you can make it, but we buy the dough and the grocery store and the brie. It takes like 10 minutes to make. And oh my gosh, it's so good. Um, but you can, you know, you can put this on toast if you want. It's really quite, quite delicious. And what, what, what the secret I think for the chanterelle jam is we follow the apricot recipe in the, in the jam directions. It's, uh, uh oh, Steven, I got you on my screen here. No more of that yawning. Uh, I saw that. I can see you. Uh, uh, it's half apricots and half fresh apricot and half uh, chanterelles. And basically what we do is we prep the chanterelles. We, we put them in a food processor and grind them up. We put them in a pot on the stove with a lid on it and we cook them just in their own juice for, until they kind of are cooked. And at this point, they're pretty goopy. And that's, that's half of the jam. The other half is just chopped up apricots like we make apricot jam we just substitute in half by volume of the chanterelles and we follow the recipe uh, uh, it's shelf stable i keep it in the fridge though uh, just because I, I love the flavor of it i want to preserve it as long as possible and this is so good and people really like it they can't when you feed it to people they can't quite put their finger on it because it's it's just it's a little savory it's really nice so chanterelle jam we have uh, a couple of actually i think two jam recipes in the book too we have one from uh was it Chad? I think Chad Hyatt, um, who's a remarkable chef, uh, gave us, was it, 
Matsutake fig jam, which is really good too. So, um, all right, that was jam. Are we ready to go to pickling, everybody? Uh, pickling is awesome. Um, it seems like when you when I talk to foragers, the longer they've been foraging, the more likely they pickle. Like pickling is somehow something a lot of people move into over time. Um, some people, obviously, it's it's rich in tradition, and especially if you've come from um, uh, some of the Eastern European cultures, you might have you might have you know really grown up eating pickled mushrooms, or you know Asian cultures are big too. I think the weird thing about pickling is mushrooms is when I started doing it, I treated the mushrooms like they were pickles, which meant I pickled them, and then we would put them on the counter and eat them with like a toothpick with an appetizer, which is fun. You know, you can do it with any mushroom. I mean, go all, all, all types of mushrooms. Um, but what we discovered was if we dial back the, the, the vinegar a little bit, so it wasn't quite as acidic. And we, we took the mushrooms and would then wash, rinse the, rinse the mushrooms after they were pickled. You can use pickling as a preservation method and pickle like entire jars of mushrooms like this. And then you can... You can eat them at will. You can take out like a whole, like a whole scoop of them, rinse them off, and then put them right into your food when you're cooking. And they're they're really they're really quite delightful. Um, let me just fix this view here. Okay. Um, um, when you when you uh, uh, pickle them that way, I think the advice came from one of our one of our foragers in the book recommended that just take a recipe and one of your favorite mushroom recipes and swap out pickled mushrooms. And you might really enjoy the flavor profiles that it changes and gives to your food. And we've started more and more just, now let's use pickled mushrooms in this recipe. And, and usually we're delighted, they're pretty good. Um, and, and I think often maybe our recipes were missing that little bit of that, that acidicness anyways that they needed to really, to really shine. So you can dial back the, you can dial back the, uh, um, uh, uh, acid a little bit on these and you know and if you're really going to do it you probably should kind of learn how ph works and you can measure your ph and keep it you know a ph uh, above i think it's 4.2 or something like that um, um so that it's still shelf stable and safe and you're going to want to kind of honor that and learn it if you're going to if you're really going to do a, a, a lot of pickling um and we we have three pickling recipes uh, in the book general general techniques uh one of them came from olga uh, Olga Cotter, um, you may know her from Mushroom Mountain, um, and hers is called Quick Pickles, and there was kind of a weird recipe. It, it, you'll get it. It, it. it basically, she had you parboil, boil mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, and put salad dressing on them, and she called it quick pickling, and it was kind of like, eh, whatever. That's kind of weird, but I'll tell you, it's good. Um, I would call them maybe more marinated mushrooms, but if you got some mushrooms, try just boiling them up. Take your favorite uh, uh, vinegar-based salad dressing, put it on the mushrooms, let them sit overnight, and you end up with a really nice marinated pickled mushroom that's fun to snack on. And it lasts, I don't know, maybe a week in the fridge at that point. It's not shelf stable or really fridge stable. It's, it's just to enjoy. It's a nice little, a nice little recipe uh, that, that's really surprisingly good, especially if you like your salad dressing. Um, and then from there, we do a hot pickle and a cold pickle. Now, those recipes are in the book. And I think we have the chat here, Kristen, if you want to kind of share some, some details on those, I think that would be, that would be helpful. Um, um, oh yeah, uh, pizza, I'm just looking at the pickle notes. So uh, before I talk about the two techniques, so let me talk about the mushrooms. We, we definitely uh, pickle chanterelles uh, in a big way, porcini. Uh, we love little baby morels, those little ones you pick to save the little ones just for pickling. Um, uh, Hedgehogs, we, we, we really like pickled hedgehogs a lot too. Um, matsutake, that's kind of what we mostly pickle, but I think anything will pickle my, nicely. My, my taki obviously is one you can pickle, but um, uh, when, you, when you pickle, uh, there's a couple things to consider. One is we have found that uh, often if you, if you cold pickle, you're gonna get a better texture. So we divide up our, our next pickling into cold and hot. In a nutshell, um, they're pretty much the same technique, but with hot pickling, after you pour the hot pickling liquid onto the mushrooms, you you pressure cook them or you you water bath them like traditional pickling for, you know, here at our altitude, I think we do it 20 minutes um, in a quart jar, and then they're shelf stable. 
Um, that's great. The, the problem is those shelf stable mushrooms, they, they get kind of slimy sometimes. So you're not going to like spoon them out of a jar and eat them. They get a little slimy texture, but if you cook them, often the sliminess will go totally away. So I would encourage you don't let the texture bother you too much. Cause if you're going to, if you're going to hot pickle and store them, store them on your shelf for, for years, um, they're going to get it maybe a little mushy, maybe a little slimy. Um, but, but cooking them will often bring it back to what you want for your recipe. So try that. Um, I like cold pickling is my preferred way. And cold pickling, you do the same thing. You, 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 you do your pickling process. You pour your hot liquid over your pickles. And when they come back down to room temperature, you put them in the fridge and they'll last. I think they last forever in the fridge. I mean, we, we keep them in the fridge for a year and we keep eating them, but they got to be in the fridge. They're not shelf stable. Uh, when they're that, that, that quick pickle. But what I find is, is I like the texture right out of the jar. It's a better mushroom. So if you don't mind the refrigerator storage, the cold pickling is, is really nice. Um, now the, there's a couple tips with pickling. Um, one is when you pack your jars like this, here's a, here's a chanterelle pickle. This is a couple of two, no, that's not a chanterelle pickle. That's a chanterelle pickle. It's a couple years old. Um, there it is. And I wanna show you how full the jar is. And the secret is if you parboil your mushrooms first and then you pack them in the jar and you pour your liquid over them, the mushrooms are pre-shrunk because you boiled them a little bit and they'll still fill the jar with your pickling liquid. If you take fresh mushrooms and put them in your jar and pour hot liquid on them, um, and then, you know, even cook them some more. What happens is you end up with a jar full of pickling juice and about four mushrooms because uh, they really shrink down and it looks really funny. So you do, you know, it, it's, it's much more economical to parboil them a little bit and then pickle them and you get like a jar full of mushrooms, not a jar full of, of, of juice. Um, let's see. Um, and so I answered that question. We do, we do, blanch the recipes, uh, the mushrooms really good. I want, I basically want to shrink them in size. That's how I know when they're done. I'm like, oh good, these are, these are pre-shrunk mushrooms. They're ready to go into the jars. Um, uh, and then our recipe, um, uh, did you, are you gonna, are we gonna share the recipe in there or? The asparagus pickling, that's, that's our basic. I love white vinegar, uh, excuse me. I love uh, champagne vinegar. Um, you can use the white vinegar for a lot of recipes. It tends to be more acidic and, and often have like a, a little different flavor. Um, a lot of people use cider vinegar, uh, apple cider vinegar, which is more cost-effective than champagne vinegar. I'm not a big fan of the flavor of it for some reason. I always taste it. I'm like, oh, it's apple cider vinegar. Um, white wine vinegar, there's all kinds of vinegars you can use and, and they, they, they're a fun way to, to boost and change the flavors of your pickling, but you can't go wrong with just plain old white vinegar uh, if you're doing it. So, um, great, I feel like that's there. I do wanna point out too, when we do morels, I, I, I boil those too. I, I don't know if they have to be cooked, but it, just in terms of mushrooms being available to your body, Right, you know, like raw mushrooms, your body has a hard time digesting. Um, you know, clearly you can eat some raw mushrooms and they're not gonna hurt you and you can get so something out of them. Um, um, and if you powder raw mushrooms, you break down the chitin and you can get more out of them. However, uh, uh, you don't have to cook mushrooms. Uh, in, effect, in effect, you can pickle, it does the same thing. You can salt and you can ferment. Um, and all three of those will break the chitins down in the mushrooms and make them bioavailable. So that's the other thing. You don't have to make, you don't have to uh, cook the mushrooms to make them available when you are pickling or fermenting or salt packing. Uh, um, all three of those will, will break those chitins down. So that, that's worth pointing out. Now we don't have any uh, lacto fermentation recipes in the book. Um, it wasn't something we're really familiar with. And frankly, I have, I didn't really like any time we've tried it and I, yeah, other people's, I'm not a fan of the flavor. So I wasn't excited to get it in the book and nobody shared a recipe with us. Um, and that's why we had the rest of the mushrooms that are in the book. We originally had more mushrooms we were going to add, except we found out a lot of people didn't have recipes for, you know, uh, pho pheasant back with that would be in the book or puff balls and um, stuff like that. No, nobody really shot us those recipes. So so there and in there, that's why we have really the 15, really, I think most popular 
mushrooms in the book. I should say 17 or 18 with a couple of medicinal mushrooms. Um, now uh, on the topic of medicinal mushrooms, we do have like a tincture recipe. Here's an example of a big jar of tincture um, made from a medicinal mushroom. This is Ganoderma brownii, which is uh, the Western artist conch. It's very similar to the Ganoderma aponatum, I think. Um, there's a, a, some nice tincture recipes in the book, which is a good way to preserve your, your medicinal mushrooms um, if, if you're into those. Um, and that, that recipe came courtesy of Trad Cotter, oh, whose book is um, Mush Organic Mushroom Farming and Remediation, a, a really well-known book. He contributed that recipe to the, to the book, which is pretty good. Um, I've only got a few minutes left, so I think I wanna just push through a, a few more fun things for you to consider with preserving um, ideas. Uh, oil packing works great. Uh, it's one of our favorite ways. And uh, here's an example of an oil packed mushroom. If you look in there, it's, it's packed in oil. And I've been keeping this in the fridge. Um, basically with oil packing, there's, there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first way we take our mushrooms, we put them in a big layer of salt. Uh, for about an hour and the salt pulls all the liquid out. The salt's all wet when you're done. We take the mushrooms out of the salt and eh, we scrape a little bit, but they're pretty salty at that point. And we boil them in vinegar for like 10 minutes, like white, pure white vinegar. And might even let them sit in there a little longer because it's like, you can't, it seems like that flavor is really good. After we boil them in vinegar, we lay them on the counter and we let them air dry for, I don't know, an hour or two or three until they're just the perfect texture and they're a little chewy. And then we pack them in oil. And oh my gosh, you guys, um, we do it with porcini and they're, they're salty and, and sour from the vinegar and they got the oil on them and they're absolutely divine. And you can just spoon them right out and put them on whatever food you want. They don't last very long, you know, in the fridge a month, maybe, um, you know, cause ultimately they're not really built for long-term storage packed in oil uh, this way. It's a really fun way to preserve mushrooms and they just taste great. And it's probably the one thing when we, like if you're really savvy about mushrooms, we would serve you that and you'll be like, people be like, what is that? How did you do that? I've never had that. It's really good. And it's just a classic, I think European, East European recipe to um, salt them, vinegar them, dry them a little bit and then pack them in oil. The other way uh, is where you put your mushrooms in the good olive oil again. And you, um, this time you cook them overnight on your stove, really low temperature. You can't burn them really low. A uh, crock pot might work better for some of you. Take the lid off or keep the lid cracked because what happens is all that moisture in the mushrooms is getting cooked out in the oil and it will, it will bubble out and then evaporate. And, uh, and the next morning, the mushrooms have pretty much been, had the kind of liquid cooked out of them and you can that oil, pack them in that oil and eat them for the next month. The difference is the second way, because you cooked them in that oil, the oil is kind of the star of the show. Um, you can take the mushrooms and spoon them onto pizza or cook with them, put them in pasta, whatever you want, and just put them right in your mouth. But they're kind of oily because they're packed in oil. But oh my gosh, the olive oil, that's what you want to spread on bread and, and do some fun things with the oil is absolutely to die for. Um, so it's almost worth, worth like cooking up some in that overnight uh, recipe just to get the oil. And that's called, um, that's called confit, uh, that technique. Now I'm, a, I'm about out of time here. Let me just look if there's anything else. Powder is a great way you can powder your mushrooms. I would urge you to only powder them more as you need them. Uh, your mushrooms will lose their flavor if you grind them into powder and store them for long term. So, you know, do it kind of as you need them. Um, Why well, I pretty much covered everything. Last one, while we're on it, salt, you can salt pack your mushrooms. Um, and if you, uh, you can cook the mushrooms in liquid, put the liquid in the salt, put the salt in the oven to dry it out and put it back in the blender to grind it up and you infuse the salt with the mushroom flavor. You can even have real mushrooms in there, bits that get ground up too, because um, in the oven, they're gonna dry out. Um, uh, but it's, you can get uh, a good salt by using the, the, the liquid, the water from cooked mushrooms. All right, wow, that was a whirlwind. What time is it? Did I go 45 minutes? We got any questions in here? Well, no. Thank you so much, Trent. That was awesome. Sure. Thanks for having us. That was that was you know it was 
a real honor to be with you guys. And frankly, kind of humbling just because, you know, I know, I know the caliber of the members of your group and the cool things you do. And, you know, if we lived in your neck of the woods, we would be totally involved with you guys and picking your brains all the time. Cause you've got so much just knowledge in your group. It's, it's crazy. Oh, the book I should mention. Yeah. The book, uh, I think it's on Amazon right now. Still it's sold out, it's sold out on Amazon. Um, we, they're, they're supposed to be back in the next week or two at the second printing, the whole first printing sold out. It was pretty cool. Um, we sell them on our website, uh, for, for $20, which is the retail price, except for buying from us, you get them signed, uh, but feel free. We don't, we don't care. Amazon. I don't know how Amazon does it. They sell them for like 15 bucks. Um, it's a hardback full color book. I'm sure they'll be back in stock there in the next, I'm going to say week or two. Um, they just ran out recently and so did we. And I guess now the publishers get it all printed overseas and it's somewhere almost ready to get shipped out here to our house. So if you want a book, we can probably have it to, in your hands in about two weeks if you order it now. Then the website is modernforager.com. That's us. I know we met s several of you at the link off for a two years ago. Any other questions in here you guys want to ask? If you do, just chat them in. And uh, otherwise, we'll uh, maybe we'll see you at a foray in the next year. I know uh, uh, we're back in business and traveling again this year. It looks like this summer. So yeah, yeah, it's looking looking hopeful. Yeah, definitely would love to see you all out our way again. And I mean, this presentation was so engaging. I feel like we could have sat here for hours and hours listening to you all. So. Maybe we could put together a workshop or something if you come back our way. Yeah, you know, person. I do, I do, I do. Uh, also, if anybody's interested in burn morales out west, which is a big thing, we chase the burn morales all over the west. Um, they're crazy how many morels there are in old wildfires. That's uh, that's something I would love to give a presentation on, and it's kind of fun, especially for maybe you guys that not where you haven't been quite as exposed to that as as people out west have. Yeah. Sweet. Well, yeah. I think at this point, yeah. uh, we'll turn things over to our, our mushroom ID session. I'll let Kara and Garrett take over and they're going to teach us, speaking of burn morels, a little bit about the morels and false morels that grow around here. Good segue. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.